significant majority of our country may not live below the poverty line, but are still chronically poor and underserved. They don't have access to basic human rights. They don't have access to justice. In the news every day, we read that the country is facing a slew of acute problems, right? Communalism, everyday violence, corruption, climate change. There are just a vast variety of problems that affect the country's most poor and marginalized sections the most. It seems to me that there is actually no better time for privileged citizens as we are to do something more than what is strictly required of us on a daily basis. As lawyers, we are all witnesses, mostly silent witnesses, to the crippling barriers that disadvantaged and marginalized people face in accessing justice. And we are told that there are two major reasons, I mean, there are several reasons why people can't access justice. One is illiteracy. The second are cultural barriers. The third, we are told there are institutional reasons, which is there aren't enough judges, there aren't enough courts, courts are not functioning fast enough. And last, but certainly not the least, we are told that people cannot access justice because they do not have access to legal assistance. There are 120 million lawyers in this country, and there are 20 elite law schools. And it's shameful that we haven't begun to scratch the surface of this chronic problem. Why haven't we begun scratching the surface of this problem? We're again told that there are explanations why we can't we don't have access to justice. The government is failing. The government is doing nothing. They're not providing access to justice. That's their duty. Second, we're told that, you know, it's not mandatory for lawyers to do pro bono work in our country. It's not compulsory. That's why we're failing. Now, these explanations are really easy on our conscience because we don't have to do anything. There's something outside of us. The system is malfunctioning, and we can sit outside and criticize. And for many, many years of my life, I bought into this story as well. I graduated from a law school and joined a law firm for a few years. I loved my work. I learned a lot. But I did feel that my vision of the world was very limited. I went to the US to pursue my master's, and there I met a very, very inspiring person, my former professor, Suzanne Goldberg. She was a lawyer for several years with a top American Civil Liberties Organization. She was the lead lawyer. She quit her job to set up a clinic program at Columbia Law School where I studied. And I was one of eight students in her class. And I was constantly inspired by the fact that not just is this person committed to social justice, but this is an extremely competent lawyer who would be a formidable opponent in court. And being inspired by her, I was forced to examine and re-examine my own career choices. I came back to India after I finished my master's, and shortly thereafter, I set up a law practice, independent law practice. I'm an intellectual property lawyer, and I simultaneously co-founded iPro Bono India. I co-founded it with Shireen Irani, who's a lawyer based in UK, who set up iPro Bono there. And Initially, the thought behind iPro Bono was that we wanted to provide access to legal services for disadvantaged individuals. We also wanted to provide access to legal services to organizations that represent disadvantaged individuals. More importantly, we wanted to build a culture of doing pro bono work in the Indian legal profession. We found that, yes, of course, lawyers do free work, but they do it in an ad hoc way. There is no systematic way in which they're able to devote their resources, so we decided that this is something that needed to change, and we wanted to develop a, a culture of pro bono. The aim was also to offer lawyers an opportunity to work with a cause close to their heart. Before we became lawyers, we did care about some things. So it's to find, again, what is it that you care about the most and allow you to contribute to that cause. We work with several marginalized communities 28 children we represented are an example of that. We also work with street vendors. We work with women from slum communities. We work with acid attack victims. We work with a, with a whole spectrum of people who have suffered disadvantages. In the early years, it wasn't very clear to me why would lawyers do pro bono work, you know? We asked ourselves that, and I thought that maybe they do it because they feel some sense of duty, you know, some responsibility, you know? They are so privileged that they feel some guilt, maybe. 
And these words, duty and responsibility, have actually been the centerpieces for our thinking around pro bono work. You know, you have a professional duty. Do it as a professional duty. And this idea of duty, responsibility, this comes from our law school education, where we are constantly taught to think in terms of rights and liabilities. You know, this is my right. I will protect my client's right. I will reduce their liability. So you think in terms of rights and liabilities, and this binary thinking is reinforced when you go to court. You're in the adversarial system. I win, you lose. Okay, and then we go on to thinking about lawyers as for-profit lawyers, not-for-profit lawyers. You know, this is the human rights type, this is the corporate type. And the question I'm going to ask today and try to answer in part is whether this thinking in binaries is a useful way to think about how lawyers are motivated to do pro bono work. I'm going to say that it's not, so spoiler alert. सामने ले आया गया तो क्या पता कैसे ना कैसे बच्चे उनको बचाने बहुत तरह से छानबीन से बच्चे पूछे फिर भी बच्चे उंगली उस मुंह पर उठाए आई प्रो बोनो इज एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दैट ऑफर्स प्रो बोनो लीगल असिस्टेंस टू सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस एज वेल एज डिसएडवांटेज इंडिविजुअल्स Through Huck Center for Child Rights, we were informed of this case where grave injustice had been done. So our role was to file an appeal against the order of acquittal of the lower court. Within a very short span of two months, we were able to convince the court that this was a case where the evidence was completely wrongly appreciated. से किस मुकदर से फिर हमको यहीं से इंसाफ इसी लोगों ने दिलवाए इनके इंसाफ दिलवाने की शुक्रिया सब दफ्तर वाले को करते हैं मैं तो हम इतनी बड़ी उम्मीद लेके नहीं कभी वो भी तो इससे मेरे को इतना बड़ा इंसाफ मिलेगा there are a lot of people who fall through the cracks in the system just because they're not able to access timely help from our work with lawyers and i personally have been have done several cases in my field of work pro bono and i find that the reason why somebody does pro bono work is actually deeply personal it's difficult for me to give an answer that would apply to everybody but there is definitely a pattern there is a pattern that explains why people why successful lawyers choose to do pro bono work i mean they spend hours weeks months sometimes years doing a case when they could be earning crores they could also be it's not even like they're getting glory out of these cases it's just sometimes one hearing one bail hearing one person's pension hearing why would they do this and i found that the three factors that motivate lawyers to do pro bono work are one they think of it as an expression of empathy these are people who have empathy and empathy is the most valuable trait you can cultivate as a lawyer no matter who you work for what does empathy mean in a lawyer's context empathy means the ability to perceive and respect your client's situation you have a old woman who comes to you she has nobody to support her she's fighting for her pension empathy 
means being able to recognize the difficulties in her situation. Empathy does not mean patronizing her. It does not mean getting emotionally involved with her case. In fact, as a lawyer, it is your responsibility to make sure that you don't get emotionally involved in the outcome of your client's cases. We also find that empathy makes you an infinitely better lawyer because you listen to what your client has to say. When you're dealing with a vulnerable client, it's very easy to patronize them and to transport your narrative onto their story, as happens in many cases. It's our job to make sure that this doesn't happen. Any client, especially a vulnerable, disadvantaged person, is entitled to their narrative within the legal system. And our job is to make sure we don't rob that story. It's not our story. It's the story that that person wants to tell, and you have to let them say it. If you don't do that, you're going to make several errors of fact, and at some point of time, it is going to emerge that it's your story and not the client's story that is being told. So this is the first factor. We find that empathy characterizes almost all the lawyers that we work with. What is the second common factor? The second common factor is the appreciating the value in interrelatedness. As lawyers, our jobs are often quite lonely, you know, because we have this fact situation, we have the law, we have our client's case, we have, we're painting on a very limited canvas. When you work on a pro bono case, especially a social justice case, your canvas expands. I was one of the lawyers representing academics and scholars in the Delhi University photocopying case. This was a case where foreign publishers had sued Delhi University and a photocopier saying that making course packs, which I'm sure all of you use for each of your courses, amounts to infringement of copyright. That case lasted five years. We won in two courts. But more than that, what was rewarding for me personally was the number of wise and wonderful people, social activists, foreign scholars, students who I got a chance to work with. Suddenly, the canvas of my work had expanded. And it included so many more people that that alone was a transformative experience for me as a lawyer. So I find that the second is also true. This factor of interrelatedness is also true for several of the lawyers we work with. They want to feel like they're part of a much bigger canvas than just painting on this small, on, on the small uh, surface of the facts and the law in your particular case. The third, I would say, the third factor that motivates people is just the pursuit of happiness. And now I'm firmly in the terrain of things that make lawyers uncomfortable, right? Lawyers don't like to talk about feelings. They want to talk about logic and reason. But I am almost 100% confident that the reason lawyers do pro bono work is because it makes them happy. And New York Times conducted a study in 2015. In 2015, they found that out of the 6,200 lawyers they interviewed, they found that there was zero correlation between the traditional markers of success, which is high-paying job, partner track, jobs at top law firms, these factors had zero correlation with happiness and well-being, right? So it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't automatically translate into how happy you're going to be or your own feelings of well-being. On the other hand, they found that people who work in public defenders' offices, right, your public prosecutor's offices, people who work in low-paying jobs, but jobs that they find meaningful, actually had a positive, those factors had a positive correlation with their sense of well-being. And in 1990, Johns Hopkins conducted a study, Johns Hopkins University conducted a study where they found that lawyers are four times more likely than the average person to be depressed. Yale Law School conducted a study as late as December last year and found that it circulated a survey questionnaire and found that 70% of the students who answered the survey had mental health issues. I don't think that if this survey was conducted in India, the results would be very different. And I think that's why we need to pause and think about it. So we found that lawyers who work with I pro bono do it because it makes them happy. They can exercise autonomy over their work. They can't live in a bubble. If you live in this country and your work is insignificant to the vast majority of the country, at some point of time, it is going to be an isolating experience. And that's what our work has told us. So now what do we do with this knowledge? We've identified that there are three factors. The first is empathy, the second is interrelatedness with people, and the third is the pursuit of happiness. Now, what does this mean? How does this change anything? 
Well, the first thing that needs to change is the conversation in law schools. When we're talking about pro bono work, shift the conversation to empathy. Empathy is a skill you can learn here. Like any other skill, it's cultivated, right? You learn law, you learn reasoning because you're trained. You need to be trained in empathy. All of us do. The second and more important intervention we can make is that identify the practices in your law school that erode empathy. Empathy to one another, empathy to the client, empathy to everybody you come across in the world. Find the factors that make that erode empathy. Find the factors that erode this feeling of interrelatedness and critically examine those processes that erode empathy. The third intervention is to recast our institutions. You know, our legal services authorities are structured in a certain way. They need to be recast so that cases of poor people are not considered charity cases. This is not about charity, right? People who come to a legal services legal aid office, you are their last chance. And you need to be competent in what you do, and you need to be com committed. And anybody who is not competent and committed has no place doing legal aid work. It's not a hobby. Do it seriously and do it to the best of your skills. And that's what legal services authorities need to be saying as a message to all lawyers who enter its doors. The last more long-term project is we need to recast the judicial process in terms of empathy. What do I mean by that? Maybe we need to rethink the spaces in which courts are situated. By its nature, court buildings themselves are inaccessible. They are cold spaces where people are often intimidated even to walk in to a court, especially a person who's illiterate, who's disadvantaged, who's marginalized, is never going to make it there because the space itself is intimidating. How one recasts the judicial process in terms of empathy, I mean, that's a subject for a whole different talk. So I'll stop here. But before I go, I do want to recite my favorite poem, which really reminds me once in a while why we do what we do. It's a poem called Manifesto by Wendell Berry. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, Vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to dive for profit, they will let you know. So friends, every day, do something that won't compute. Love the Lord. Love the world. Work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free country for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant and that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophecy such returns. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, Lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox, who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Thank you.